We are beginning a new sermon series titled, Now You're Talking, about how to have spiritual conversations. And uh, I I think that you all know this, but I just want to sometimes reiterate uh, that pastors who speak on topics, we're not always experts in every topic that we talk about. Uh, We hopefully spend time researching, studying, uh, trying to be good stewards of, of what God has given us to talk about. And so when I knew I was feeling led for us to go through a a series about talking about our faith, Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was to go read from uh, Jonathan Merritt, who literally wrote a book on having spiritual conversations. And Jonathan is a a son of a megachurch pastor. He grew up in the Bible Belt. He grew up around a lot of, of faith stuff. He went to Bible college. He went to seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. And he moved from Atlanta to New York City and he realized that he was having a hard time having God talk in his regular life, that uh, he found himself having to explain himself all of the time, that uh, he'd say phrases and things like that that people just didn't understand. And, and we all know God talk of, uh, you know, we don't have uh, coffee time, we have fellowship time. We don't, you know, we, we just have all sorts of phrases for the same things. And, you know, we take communion, we, uh, we have a benediction. You know, we have phrases and words that not everybody uses all the time. And, you know, we don't just mess up or we don't make mistakes. We sin. Uh, We give glory to God, and we don't always know how to even define glory. You know, we sing about raising our Ebenezer, and we're like, well, I don't really know what that is. You know, we have God talk. And so Jonathan in New York City was finding himself having to explain himself all the time, translating what on earth he's talking about. And then after a little while, he realized he just kind of slowly stopped talking about God, that It just kind of filtered out of his everyday conversations, and he wanted to know, am I alone? Am I the only only person that that struggles with talking about my faith? And so it helps to have connections, and so he worked with the Barna Research Group, and they conducted a study about how people have uh, spiritual conversations, how often, uh, who does, who doesn't. And so they did a study. And the results were not necessarily great if you want people to talk about their faith. Uh, The study came back and it said that one out of 10 Americans have a spiritual conversation at least once a week. So one out of 10 have a weekly spiritual conversation. And it's not even that much better uh, for practicing Christians. Uh, It went from like 7% to 13% of people had a once a week spiritual conversation. That's not very many people engaging in regular spiritual conversations. Uh, When you looked at three-fourths of Christians, so most Christians, they didn't have a spiritual conversation at least once a month. And the average adult, the average American, had one spiritual conversation a year. One One a year. Like, you know, if you had a spiritual conversation with somebody, chances are that was their one spiritual conversation for the year. They've checked the box and it's over for the year. Uh, that's not a lot of spiritual conversations. And what makes me even more concerned is we know people tend to lie on surveys. They tend to talk about themselves as being more regular at things than they usually actually are. And so the studies came back, translation, we don't talk about God very much. And so maybe that makes Jonathan feel a little bit more at ease of like, well, I'm not alone here. But it doesn't necessarily make uh, this situation a good one. And so maybe you find yourself also struggling to talk about God, to talk about faith and your spiritual practice. You know, we, we often even find that in churches, you know, we might show up at church, we might pray prayers, we might sing songs, we might listen to scripture. But like before and after we come and go, and our conversations usually stay pretty, uh, you know, surface level of how's the weather, what are you planning on eating today, how was the game, you know, like we can't help ourselves. We, we end up staying on, on conversations that don't always elevate to what is God doing in your life? You know, what is God doing in the midst of this last year? Uh, how are you doing? Because it's, it's been a tough year and, and having real meaningful conversation. And so we struggle to have those conversations, and sometimes we, ha- we struggle because there's plenty of reasons for us that we can make up of why we don't talk about God. Uh, maybe you're afraid of causing division, and of like, oh, it's going to be this divisive conversation. I don't want to get into it. Uh, maybe because so much of our faith gets wrapped up into political ideologies and split parties of, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to get into this stuff. 
And sometimes we just actually aren't interested, and we just don't care that much, so we don't want to talk about it. And so we all, I think, as a community, we, we struggle with, how do I make spiritual conversations a part of my regular life? How do, I, how do I live out the fact that Jesus gave us a great commission, that Jesus calls us to go out in the world and to share good news? And yet we struggle with doing that. And so we might realize that going without talking about our spiritual lives, uh, it goes a day and it goes a week, it goes a month, it goes a year, suddenly we realize that our spiritual talk, our God talk, has become a foreign language to us. And so it might be helpful to know that we are not alone, whether that's today in this world and people around us, Uh, but it wasn't easy for the first Christians to talk about God either. They had their own challenges. I mean, the first Christians, they don't even know to call themselves Christians yet. They're trying to find the label for themselves. Who are we? And some people say, we're, the, we're on the way, which I, I love. It's not really pinned down. Uh, we're on the way. And so some people start calling them Christians, and at some point they're like, yeah, that's fine. That, that works for me. Um, but they don't even know how to describe themselves. You know, when Jesus leaves them, he, he empowers them, he, he calls them to action, but they don't necessarily know how to talk about all of this. How do you talk about Easter? How do you talk about what just happened? And so these people that sometimes found themselves denying Christ or doubting or struggling to profess their faith or Jesus asking them questions and them getting the questions wrong, they're the people, like you and me, charged with, go share this good news with the world. And so that's a, that's a tough task when we can understand why, wait, that's challenging. Like, they have to figure out how to put words to what's just happened in their life. And most of Jesus' disciples were not trained speakers. They weren't educated in rhetoric. They weren't, like, you know, there's got to be some people who had some high education, but most of them were common, everyday folks. And they are not trained with, how do I give the best argument, the best, you know, uh, persuasion, And some of the way that we can see this at work is that our New Testament is written in in Greek, and it's written in a very common form of Greek, in everyday kind of vernacular. And it allows uh, a lot of pastors who who didn't have a lot of Greek study, but you could actually, in a fairly short amount of time, get enough study to feel like you can translate a good portion of the New Testament, because it's pretty basic and simple. And one of my favorite activities that I've had around Greek was Uh, I had a doctoral seminar with a professor on the first day of class. His favorite thing to do is to assign the class to read uh, Aesop's Fables. And it's for a room of people who've done tons of Greek study and and you feel like you know Greek fairly well, and then you get classical Greek children's literature and you're like, I don't even know how to get at this. Like a kid's book is hard. Uh, And so this common Greek, this everyday language, you know, they're trying to figure out how to talk about Jesus, how to talk about God, And we all are on that same journey. And so in Acts chapter 2, we get a story about how God empowers and elevates this group of disciples in a way that they can start talking, in a way that they can start proclaiming their faith to the world. And so the disciples needed help, and so let's read from a part of Acts 2 in which we see God coming to help and empower this community. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability." Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each of them heard them speaking in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? I'm going to skip a few verses to say, uh, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. In this scene, it's quite amazing. Like, you know, I love movies. I would just imagine the direction of how do you do this scene of these people gathered together, uh, and you're trying to figure out this kind of metaphorical image of like tongues like fire, uh, 
of like, what physically do you see? What are you experiencing in this room? This gust of wind, this noise coming out. And it's causing so much commotion that others are showing up to the scene. And it's, and it's gotta be amazing. Uh, you've got young men and old preaching. You've got men and women. You've got uh, this community suddenly empowered to, to speak in a language uh, that is understandable, uh, to speak in the language of all these people who've gathered. Uh, but before we get to that miraculous part, I feel like it's so easy to jump to that. Uh, there's something very powerful that happens in the story uh, that is the place, the context in which God moves. This is a community who gathered together. This was a community who was engaged in their spiritual practices. It was a custom, it was a part of their daily life. They lived out their faith. They showed up. Uh, the whole city is showing up for a pilgrimage, but like this community is gathering as one. And they're in one place. And in Acts, we get a few images of what they do when they gather together. I actually wanna read the end of Acts 2 where you get a, a glimpse of what this community did while they were together. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to anyone who had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Uh, this is a community spending time together and life together, having meals together, listening to teaching together, praying together, being at the temple. Like this is a community who lived with each other, who, was, who were devoted, who showed up. And God shows up on the scene, not just uh, to a random person. God could have done that. God could have just shown up to a random person who happened to be in Jerusalem and chose to speak through them. But God chose on Pentecost Sunday to to show up to a community who was regularly faithful, who were regularly engaged in their spiritual practices and following God, that their kind of everyday showing up didn't always have a miraculous thing happen, but one day in the midst of the everyday religious life of this community, God chose to move them, to transform them, to elevate their everyday life and their everyday speech. And so this community, showed up to God, and God showed up to them. And we might miss, in the midst of that study I talked about earlier from the Barna group, that, that primarily said, no one's talking about God. But for those who did talk about God regularly, they wanted to know why. why what's the common denominator here? And one of the biggest signs that you were going to be someone who was eager to converse about God was that you had regular spiritual practices. That regularly you would read scripture, that you would pray, you would fast, or whatever kind of practices that you partake in. That if you were regularly engaged in your faith, you would be more likely to talk about it. And so I think it was 64% of people uh, who were eager to have spiritual conversations said that they read their Bible at least once a week. And so if you are just... At a, at a baseline wondering, how do I talk better? How do I, how do I talk more about God? Spend time with God. Spend time with a community of faithful. Read your Bible, spend time in prayer. Uh, because if you're thinking about something and you're practicing something, chances are you're gonna talk about it. If you were really interested in going into investing in the stock market and you spent a lot of time researching the market, you were researching companies, you're doing all of this stuff, chances are sometime in that month, you're gonna start talking to random people about are you investing? Do you know anything about this company? It just, it's a matter of fact that if you spend time and you're invested in something, you're gonna start talking about it. And so for people who don't practice their faith, they aren't living that out in the world, uh, you stop thinking about it. And if you stop thinking about it, you stop talking about it. And the sad reality is we live in a world that more and more people are exiting churches and leaving their faith traditions behind. And so they're gonna stop talking about it. And for those who haven't left it behind, we often just default back to let's not talk about it. And before long, we're not living out our faith, we're not talking about our faith. 
But God chose on Pentecost to show up to a community who are faithfully showing up to each other and to God. And God elevated their voices on that day. Now, people want that Pentecost miracle. They want to be able to, to have this superpower, right? But how often do we actually want to do the, the work of just showing up to God regularly, of uh, the good labor? Like, uh, I always like to talk about work not as a bad thing. Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, they're placed there to till the soil, to work in this garden in this idyllic image, uh, not to labor in this painful way, but the good work that God has for you. And so many of us want to bypass uh, the life of the faithful and, and to be devoted to God and to each other and just get the miracle, just get the powerful moment at the end of the story. And so it's in the context of this faithful community that God moves. And I love that what God moves uh, in this story is God moves through translation. That what's the miracle of the story is that God translates to people so they can hear. And we should always know this, uh, that God obviously has to uh, simplify some things for us to understand it, uh, that, that things are too complex for us to understand, and, and God has to accommodate and talk in a way that we can understand. Uh, but in this story, he helps this community of faithful learn how to talk so that their neighbors can understand. And so in this scene, you have people coming from all over the Roman Empire for this festival. You've got this pilgrimage going on. So you have Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire, and they've come into Jerusalem, and they're, you, know, you find a, an inn or whatever to stay at. And you're there, and suddenly you start hearing somebody talking your language, and you're like, wait, what's going on? And I haven't traveled too much out of, out of the country in my life, but when I went to Israel, when I went to Serbia, you just can't help it. Like, if you hear someone talking your language in a context that you're not expecting it, your ear goes that direction. Like, oh, I wonder what they're talking about. Oh, I can understand this. Or when you have a sign that you can actually read, you're like, oh, thank you. I, lo I love, I can read this. And so this, this community of pilgrimage uh, that's happening in Jerusalem, they start hearing these disciples speak in their language, and they can't help but be drawn to it. What's going on here? Who are these people? What are they talking about? And it's uh, quite startling to them because they see these people that are talking in their language like, wait a minute, those are Galileans. How are they talking in my language? And I love that the Bible includes that little line, they must be drunk. <laughs> There's no explanation here. Like, what on earth is happening here? It's a bunch of drunk Galileans. That must be what's going on here in this story. And they're just marveling that they can understand each other. There's a YouTuber that I love following. Uh, he, he has a unique channel, and he does kind of like Pentecost-type stories in every video that he does. He is a 20 or 30-something white dude living in New York City, and he walks around Chinatown, and he goes to street vendors and to restaurants, and, and he's talking to them in English, and then he suddenly starts talking in Mandarin. Because as an adult, he studied uh, Mandarin, and he went and spent a year in Beijing and, and learned Cantonese and a few other dialects. But nobody's expecting this white dude showing up at their store to suddenly start talking in Cantonese or Fujianese or these kind of smaller dialects. And so he gets these interesting reactions because no one is expecting to hear their language coming from him. And so he walks into a store and he's saying, hey, how much is this? What is this like? And then he just suddenly slips into a uh, correct kind of sounding dialect of, of, of the language that they speak. And it's so interesting because there's the double take that always happens, <laughs> where, and it's on camera. I love the hidden footage where they're like, wait, um, wait, you're talking my language. And sometimes people have their back turned to the camera, and so they just hear the language and they turn around and then they're startled. Like, wait, this is the guy talking to me? And it's this really interesting phenomenon that these people who were business owners and customer uh, become people. Like, you went from this client relationship to, like, who's this person in front of me? And you quickly slip from how much are these socks or how much is this food to, like, how long have you lived here? How'd you learn this language? Tell me your story. And suddenly you start talking as people because this, this language has crossed a bridge. It's created this, this connection point where people can understand one another and learn from one another. And it's beautiful to see. 
And people might wonder, you know, like, why is, this, why is he making these videos? Why are people watching them? Uh, and it might be like, oh, I just want to see the spectacle. Maybe I just want to see people's reaction shots. Maybe if you speak Mandarin, you're like, I just want to see how good he is and hear it for myself. Uh, but his, his videos, which sometimes have comical titles like, Clueless White Guy Orders in Perfect Chinese, Shocks patr Patrons and Staff. Uh, that video has 62 million views on YouTube. Like, why are so many people fascinated by these little moments of people uh, speaking another language to each other? I don't think it's the spectacle. It's, I think what's actually going on is we just want to see human connection. We want to see those walls come down and people actually be able to talk to one another. And you're wondering, like, what would it be like if I could show up and I could just be able to talk in a way where we could be like friends, we could grow as in a relationship, we could understand each other. And so he's having those little moments and surprising people that, that the world is a little bit different than you expect. And I think that's what draws people to the story. But there's also something kind of interesting and, and peculiar about each of those videos. When Shama starts talking to someone, oftentimes they start telling him, you're so smart. You speak all these languages, you're so smart. How do you do this, you're so smart. In all of those videos, he's talking to people who speak multiple languages. Like they're doing the literal same thing as him, but they're fascinated by him that he's able to talk like that. And I think what's at play is uh, when you're a, a minority community group, you expect I have to take on the majority. I gotta figure out how to speak this language, I gotta figure out the customs. But too often, the majority never has an interest in you. They're never actually interested in to learn your ways, learn how to speak your language. And so they're shocked because here's a random white guy who's suddenly speaking with them. Too often, the church is uninterested in learning how to talk to its neighbors. We do so much God talk. We've had such a majority tradition that the culture should understand us. They should know what we mean when we invite them to worship. We should know what they should expect to do when they show up in a worship service. We expect them to speak our church language, and it's just kind of weird if you don't. And we don't do the work of trying to learn how to speak the language of the other. And I love that the Pentecost image is, is God coming and empowering these people to learn how to speak the language of the other, that they can learn how to talk to these people from across the world. Because the task of spread the gospel throughout the world is a, a massive task. And God moves in them to say, hey, find the language of these people. I will empower you to speak their language. Talk to them. And we don't have a biblical tradition that was saying, you know, our Old Testament's written in Hebrew. Hebrew is the authoritative language. We're only going to speak Hebrew from now on. You had a church who learned Greek who was reading the Old Testament in a translation form in Greek, who went out throughout the, the Roman Empire trying to figure out, I, it's good for us that a lot of people know Greek, uh, but you've got even in the letter to the Romans that Paul's like, I'm about to, I wanna go to Spain, and I don't quite speak Greek in Spain. I'm gonna need some translation help, I'm gonna need some help, can somebody help me along the way? Uh, the church wanted to translate their message to the people of the world and to their neighbor, and it's a beautiful image that happens at Pentecost. And so all of the people in the city are wondering, who are these Galileans that they speak my native language? Today is Pentecost Sunday in which I think we are all tempted to want to read this story as a history textbook, that this is just a story about this one time in which the church spoke miraculously and could talk to their neighbors. And we're a little afraid to make this text a prescriptive model story of how we should live our lives. But this story is an invitation that the church should be about translating good news to the people around us. We're invited into this Pentecost story. And so no matter what your age is, your gender, your education level, your ability, you are invited to show up in daily life to God to be about prayer and scripture reading to be about God's community, and maybe, just maybe, in the midst of that, God will help elevate your speech to actually make sense, <laughs> to be understandable. Because uh, sometimes that language difference isn't just about a, you know, English and Mandarin, but just English and English.
that God might take your language and transform it in a way that speaks to your neighbor. And so this story is an invitation. And so if you have been distant from God, whether unintentionally or intentionally, this story is an invitation to show up to God, to show up, just spend some time in prayer. Spend some time reading scripture, uh, show up to God. You know, we could read uh, the great hymns and the great worship songs, read the great creeds, read church history, read how God has been faithful to people throughout the years. Uh, Spend time reflecting, contemplating, uh, just being with God. And a part of being with God every day is the transformation that you should be with those around you, that you should be fully present, you should see the people that are around you, Uh, the people that you overlook and you don't try to understand or speak to, are actually a part of God's kingdom plans. And so that the stranger in your midst is also the opportunity to see God at work and to become brothers and sisters with somebody else. And so the invitation is to uh, to show up to God and to show up to each other. And if we live that out faithfully, maybe, just maybe, somebody might experience you, experience us, and say, who are those people? Are those people from First Baptist Jackson? They're speaking my language. And maybe they might encounter God. May we all show up to God and to each other and to neighbors near and far. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask your forgiveness for the times where we are distant, where we run away, where we hide and and ignore you in our life or ignore your, your call on our, on our daily life. Lord, I ask that for those who have been distant, that you might make the, the prodigal son imagery real to them, that, uh, that when we return to you, you are always running to us. Lord, I ask that you might cultivate our hearts, that we might be passionate about your kingdom, that we might love like you love, and that through loving we might want to share about it. Lord, I ask that the people in this uh, in the space that are, and the people who are worshiping with us might have uh, this, this overwhelming love and passion that they can't help but talk about who you are. Lord, I ask that you might transform our conversations that you might transform our conversations with, with family, with friends, with neighbors, with coworkers, with, with strangers. Lord, help us to be aware of how you are moving in our midst and to point to you. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.